It's to the best of our knowledge. I'm Anne Strangehamps. In the spring of 2011, in a locked room at a law firm in Madison, Wisconsin, a group of Republican aides and consultants met to remap the state's voting districts. There are more Republicans that are affected by pairings than there are Democrats. Under a strict cone of silence, they devised a set of maps with a single overriding objective, keep the Republican Party in power for a decade. We have once again fulfilled one of the promises that we made. And I'm not going to apologize for that. But meanwhile, another group of professionals was growing concerned about gerrymandering, not just in Wisconsin, but across the country. Mathematicians. We always thought it was a geometric story. We split the state up into districts here in Wisconsin. There's 99 assembly districts. The question of what those regions should look like is fundamentally a question about shape, fundamentally a geometric question. This is Jordan Ellenberg. He's a world-class mathematician and a professor at the University of Wisconsin, and he is about to convince me that geometry is crucial to democracy. The classic idea of what gerrymandering looks like is it looks like these legislative districts that look ridiculous They sort of snake all over the place and have octopus tentacles, and you look at them and you're like, that didn't happen naturally. You know, I talked to somebody who was involved in the process in the 80s, and the way it worked then is you sat across from each other at a big wooden table, kind of like the table we're sitting across from each other at right now, and you rolled out this giant map of the state of Wisconsin on paper, (laughs) and everybody would be there with their wax pens and kind of like moving it a little bit here and moving it a little bit there and seeing how to eke out some advantage. Well, we don't do it that way anymore. We can now look at 10,000 options in the space of a few seconds, right? So our ability to search the space of all possible ways to gerrymander has ramped up so much that people are increasing their own power and cementing their own hold on the majority in a way that just wasn't possible in the early days of this process. So what do you do if you're one of the few people in the world trained to understand the complex geometry that could push back against party hacks armed with advanced computing power? Temperamentally, most of us are not rabble-rousers. When mathematicians get excited about something, it is because it's both of social importance and it's interesting to think about from a mathematical point of view, which this problem is. So is gerrymandering not actually all that interesting mathematically? No, no, it is interesting. That's why I started thinking about it. Luckily, there's a tried-and-true academic method for dealing with complex issues. Convene a conference. Yeah, it was cool. It was a real experiment. This was 2017, and I think people were just starting to grasp what a big political issue this was. The Geometry of Redistricting Conference ran for three days. Attending were mathematicians, political scientists, lawyers, engineers, geographers, plus the Solicitor General of Wisconsin the guy who was, at the time, defending the state's gerrymandered assembly districts in court. And also the plaintiff in that same case, the guy who was currently suing to have those maps overturned. So, you know, no pressure or anything. So it's a charged moment, you know, the plaintiff in Gill versus Whitford, the Wisconsin redistricting case, Bill Whitford, he sort of stood up. Wisconsin is so far over any reasonable line. In front of, like, the man... Mr. Zeitlin was arguing the case against him. So you would have federal courts deciding, well, what would it be under this map or that map? And I was like, is something going to happen? Are like these two old guys in suits going to fight? Like, no, it wasn't like that. But it, <laughs> but it was a charge. They didn't fight. They didn't fight. In the end, there's two human beings with opposing goals who stand facing each other to sort of, how to put it, something that's kind of abstract And I think there's a human part of the story. Maybe there's a stereotype that to think about things mathematically means neglecting that part of the story. And I think just the opposite is true. So I wanted to begin with that story because it illustrates the fundamental point we want to dig into today. Geometry explains the world. Yeah, I did one with like a cellist who likes science and talked about 
Jordan Ellenberg, as you might have guessed, is not only a world-famous mathematician, he's my neighbor. We live a few blocks apart. We're always running into each other on campus or at the local coffee shop. <laughs> he's one of those people who is curious about literally everything. He's also a great writer. His first book, How Not to Be Wrong, was a huge hit. And the most recent, just out in paper, is called Shape. It's about the hidden geometry of everything. So usually, when I run into Jordan, I ask, what's new? Today, I asked a variation. What's new in geometry? Oh, like, everything is new all the time. I mean, it's uh, we, we are in a geometric era. We're in an era where geometry and all kinds of math are... You know, more math is probably being created every day now than ever before in human history. Really? By an incredible amount. One obvious place this is happening is, of course, in the development of machine learning and artificial intelligence, which mm -hmm. is like absolutely at its bottom a geometric endeavor. You're trying to develop a program that can solve a problem. Mm -hmm. I want to write the first three paragraphs of my romance novel and I want to have the computer write the rest. Okay, so that's like, <laughs> um, how are you going to search that impossibly huge space of all possible textual strategies that you might use. And that is a fundamentally geometric problem, one that people are working on everywhere. Like Why every is that day. geometric? Because the space of all possible programs is a gigantic high dimensional space. And that's not just a metaphor, like it really is. Okay, ready? We're gonna go we're gonna get into it. Okay. I feel like you kind of implicitly asked me to, so I'm gonna do it. Yep. Um if you were trying to devise a program to do something. You can imagine what a computer program looks like. It looks like, I don't know, some sort of long string of text. And maybe in that text, there's some letters and there's some numbers. Maybe the program has like a thousand numbers in it. And maybe if you chose a thousand different numbers, the program would work better. Well, how the hell do you know? How, the, how are you going to choose, go through each one and pick the very best value to make the program be as good at writing a romance novel as it can possibly be? Didn't sound like geometry, right? What I said. No. I'm going to make it sound like geometry. Okay. Because what if there was just two numbers? What if literally your program were incredibly simple and there was just two numbers in it? Well, two numbers to me is a point in the plane. This was the great insight of our hero, Rene Descartes, who had the idea that you can take a plane and you can describe every point by an X coordinate and a Y coordinate. In the context of geography, we call it a longitude and a latitude. You can describe any point on the earth by a pair of numbers. And so there's this fundamental metaphor that's so profound. It underlies everything in all of life that like a list of numbers is the same thing as a point in space. A pair of numbers, like a longitude and a latitude, is like a point on a surface, a two-dimensional space like the surface of the earth. Three numbers, an X, a Y, and a Z coordinate, that's like a point in three-dimensional space. If I tell you a longitude and a latitude and then one more number for a height above the Earth, I've specified some point in three-dimensional space. So you're sort of suggesting that geometry touches all kinds of math, all numbers, that if you're working with numbers, there kind of is a geometry to it no matter what? Absolutely. And that's how we solve problems, right? We sort of geometrize everything. So if this romance novel writing program is specified by a list of a thousand numbers and you got to get each one of them right... I got to wander around thousand dimensional space until I find just the right spot, just the right spot that writes maximally arousing romance novels. And that problem is just finding your way to like the best spot in some thousand dimensional room. When I put it that way, it's a geometry problem. But all that I just told you, we knew like 300 years ago and you were asking what's happening now. Oh my God. Okay. What's happening now? <laughs> What's happening now that's so interesting is basically all of these geometric algorithms for so-called artificial intelligence systems or machine learning systems that can carry out these tasks incredibly well, they can play Go better than any human, all of these methods we have, they work much better than they should. And nobody understands why. I think that's the fundamental question that people are wrestling with every day. And I think it's fundamentally a geometric question because it's about searching this high dimensional space. What's it like to be a geometer today? And let's awesome. say Awesome. Oh, sorry, do you have a further question? <laughs> and and to try to imagine 
a shape or a thing that exists in, I don't know, eight dimensions. Uh, yeah, so th- you know, there's a wonderful quote of Jeff Hinton, who is at the University of Toronto and is one of the founders of the theory of neural nets. He's giving a talk and somebody asks him, Professor Hinton, like, how do you visualize a 14-dimensional space? And he said, well, you visualize a three-dimensional space and then very loudly say, 14! <laughs> And this is absolutely true. It's kind of a miracle, but we have this kind of built-in geometric intuition. It's in our bodies, this intuition about what things look like and what it means when things are close to each other and far away and how things move and what paths things take. All that intuition is about the two-dimensional and three-dimensional geometry. And yet a lot of that stuff works really, really well in any number of dimensions. In 14 dimensions, are you even talking about shapes then? Oh, yeah. I would say. Because isn't the fourth dimension time? So this is the kind of thing where if somebody asks this in my class, I'm like, no, you're totally wrong, but in such a useful and good way. <laughs> <laughs> you must be a very good teacher. Thank you. I just said something stupid. Okay, no, tell, no, me, why it's it's not, not, <laughs> tell I mean, me why it's not so bad. The, the point is, it's not stupid. It's like, um, do you know the phrase, ontology recapitulates yes. phylogeny, right? So I mean, mm-hmm. teaching is like that, right? Over the course of the class, we're recapitulating the entire history of mathematics and our developing understanding because it was the old fashioned to be like, what is the fourth dimension. Now we just say, let's think in the abstract about what four-dimensional spaces can be. I'm still struggling to understand dimensions. I'm sorry. I'm just, it fascinates me because part of me thinks, um, well, then if we happen to live in the universe with four dimensions, but we know all these other dimensions exist, then are you suggesting there are other universes possibly just moving through us and around us that are in different dimensions, and so we just can't see them. Except I think that's a complete misunderstanding of what a dimension actually is. Well, that is a thing that people think may be the case, but in some sense, in math, we care about what could be much more than we care about what actually is. Some people see that as a moral failing, but I see it as a great strength, probably our special and unique strength. You know, if we can conceive it, then for us, it exists, Mm -hmm. because we can say something about it. Okay, I'll tell you a story. It's the story of Flatland. I don't know if you ever read this book when you I were a kid. I haven't read it, but I know about it. It's set in a two-dimensional world called Flatland, and the narrator of this book is a square. His entire world is composed of polygons. Different social classes are different kinds of polygons. And one day he's in his house and he sees a little circle. It's like, ha, how'd the circle get into my house? Circles are very noble in his world. And then the circle starts getting bigger. It starts growing. Now, this is very science fictional and weird to him, right? Just as if suddenly there was like a little tiny miniature human in your house, and then it started sort of (laughs) expanding. And the square is like, what, who are you, mystical, like, size-changing circle? And the circle says, you misunderstand. I'm not a circle. I'm a sphere. I'm a sphere that's slowly entering your world crossing into your plane and my cross section is getting bigger and bigger but what you are seeing of me is only this two dimensional section and of course the square is like that is nonsensical there's no such thing as the third dimension (laughs) maybe you found some way you're a circle that's found some way to make yourself bigger or smaller but like what you're saying is ridiculous and they have this kind of long philosophical argument as one does in a 19th century novel and then finally the sphere kind of uh gives up and just grabs the square by the corner and just jerks him up out of his world, turning him on his side so he can see his entire world globally that he was previously only able to see from the inside. So that he can see for himself from the third dimension just how limited his perspective has been. So here's where this story gets really subversive. The sphere explains to the square, oh, there's a thing like you in the third dimension called a cube and they walk through the reasoning of like how he could know that a cube has eight points you have four vertices you have four corners a cube would have eight corners 
And the square is very excited about this, like our best math students, and says, oh, so I get it. So the four-dimensional version of me would have to have 16 corners, and the sphere is like, what the hell are you talking about? There's no fourth dimension. That's ridiculous. <laughs> Three is how many dimensions there are. So this is an incredibly powerful parable about learning mathematics because on the one hand, it shows you that can either the sphere or the square see or perceive the fourth dimension? No, they cannot. But by the mechanism of our reason, the square is able to figure out things about it which are true and correct without actually experiencing it. And that's what abstract math can do for us. We can reason past what we can see and feel. And of course, the other part of it, it really captures the way that Math can be a locus of power, right? The sort of square is figuring something out and the sphere who is moments ago in this position of authority <laughs> is like, wait, wait, I don't like this. Like, I don't, um, but there's nothing the sphere can do about it, right? The square figured it out. And so there's a kind of amazing fact about the history of geometry is that geometry is often seen as kind of dangerous because it represents this other point of authority, like knowledge that you can make yourself without taking it from some other source of received wisdom. I love that. And I also love the connection to, I'm thinking about your chapter about Thomas Jefferson and Abraham Lincoln and the connections between geometry, in this case, Euclidean geometry, and the foundation of the democracy. Jefferson and Lincoln both were lovers of mathematics, but in very different ways. Jefferson is kind of the patrician. He sees it as like part and parcel. You learn Euclid because you also learn like Thucydides. Euclid, just to be clear, that's that's the kind of geometry that we learned in school, right? Where you're forced to write theorems or prove that a triangle looks like a triangle. I wish like you guys triangle. could see the expression on Anne's <laughs> face right now, which maybe is the expression on your face, too, as you recall your ninth grade geometry education. Um, yeah, so Euclid is this kind of classical tradition of we are going to start from a set of axioms about points and lines and circles, and from that, build up everything step by step. People's feelings about it over the years have been very ambivalent. Many people find it dull. I'm going to be honest, I was one of them. That was not really my jam. Other people have found themselves incredibly inspired by it, and Lincoln was one. It's the only kind of math I ever liked. <laughs> well, that, yeah. Well, and that's where I, I started loved it because it was logical. I felt like you just move from one thing to another very carefully, and you. Pr I just I loved it. And, you know, one of the... Genesis, 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 um, one of the origins of this book for me was having conversations just like this. I wrote another book about math about seven mm -hmm. years ago. So it meant I was going around giving a lot of talks to people about math. And then afterwards you give your talk and then afterwards people come and talk to you. It's like therapy. They come and talk to you about the math experience that they have been holding on to for like 30 years. Did you feel years. like you were a you know, therapist to a generation of people who'd been traumatized by math? I'm not trained, but I did my best. <laughs> but there's two things that you hear a lot. People who are like, I really liked all the stuff with like algebra and trigonometry and calculus where there's a question and what's the answer and it's a number and you get the answer. But geometry, like what was going on there? Then suddenly there was this, all this stuff about like two column proofs and triangles and saying like some fact that I can completely see is obvious. Like, why are you asking me to prove it? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, I felt like finally we were talking about something real. I don't know why. And then there's people like you, right? So, you know, this is why I say in the book that geometry is the cilantro of math. <laughs> like, there's people who love it and there's people who hate it. But everybody recognizes that it's mm. different from everything else. Now it's one of the things that maybe want to sort of make that the theme of the book in the first place. You know, like, what's going on? Why is this one thing feel so different even from the rest of mathematics? What are we talking about, Lincoln? We're talking Lincoln, about Lincoln and Jefferson. Uh, Hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah, we're recording an interview. Oh, shoot, did... Oh, thank you very much. Oh. Okay, there's nothing like getting so absorbed in a conversation about math that you fail to notice the dog sneaking away. That's how I know I'm good radio. You didn't even notice your own dog escaping. Hold on. We'll be right back. On to the best of our knowledge. <laughs> From Wisconsin Public Radio, NPRX. Do you like going on tour? Love or? it. Oh, okay. Love it. Hey, we're back. 
with Jordan Ellenberg, author of Shape, The Hidden Geometry of Information, Biology, Strategy, Democracy, and everything else. I love going to some random store and meeting like 12 people <laughs> and like... Even though I know they all treat you like their math therapist. <laughs> So we're talking about people who love and maybe don't like geometry. Well, it turns out some of America's founders not only loved geometry, they were so obsessed with it, they even worked a little Euclid into the Constitution. I think you say in the book, if you read the Constitution carefully, you can kind of see how Euclidean geometry, at least the habit of thinking that's required when you do Euclidean geometry, is in there. And it's a famous argument, you know, of course, the very beginning, we hold these truths to be self-evident. That's an incredible Euclidean move, right? To say, like, let's start with some set of axioms and then build everything else up from that. Now, it's actually very controversial about whether that line is there because of Euclid or whether it has anything to do with Euclid or even exactly who wrote it. Like, we don't totally know. But what's certainly... But wasn't there... There was an earlier version... Somebody originally had said something like, we hold these truths to be sacred. Yes, and, I think that's yeah, right. And they and switched think, to self-evident, which does have a more democratic, like, no, it's not sacred from on high. It's self-evident, as in you proved it or figured it out. Oh, yeah. I, I hadn't made that connection, but you're right. It's exactly the same distinction that I'm talking about at the end of the book. Well, missed opportunities, because if you <laughs> we had, had this conversation before. Because you're right that that distinction is exactly the distinction I'm making about where does the authority in the end come from? Does it come from yourself and your own reason, or does it come from tradition, or does it come from on high? But Lincoln is different, I want to say this. So Lincoln yeah. is self-educated. He learns Euclid not as a child in school, because he didn't go to school, but much later when he's already a lawyer, and he's kind of going around in court being asked to prove things, and he's like, what do they mean, prove? Well, he's a demonstrate. He's like, what does this word demonstrate mean that I'm allegedly doing in court? He sets himself to read Euclid, to read it all, and he's like, if I'm going to be a real lawyer, I got to understand like what it means to actually prove something. Does he actually read it with a pencil or pen in hand? Does he do the calculations? Oh, yeah. No, he, so his law partner sort of just talked about, you know, they're just going around at the law circuit in these small towns in Illinois. And he goes to sleep and Lincoln is sitting in bed. Scratching. Like, working it. on his problems in Euclid. <laughs> he tells this amazing story of Lincoln trying to square the circle, which is this famously impossible classical problem of Euclidean geometry. In Lincoln's time, it hadn't yet been proved to be impossible. It would be proved to be impossible in 1882. But people kind of knew. People kind of knew, like, look, it's been like 2,000 years. Probably it's impossible because nobody's done it yet. But Lincoln tried, as many other people have. And, you know, he talks about Lincoln basically didn't do anything for two days except sit at his desk in the law office drawing more and more circles <laughs> and, like, trying to crack this problem. And then... You know, he gave up and his law partner is like, we could tell he was kind of upset about it, so we just never brought it up again. <laughs> like, they're all like, dude, let's get a drink. Come right. on. <laughs> but what they say about him, and I found this quite moving, was one of his contemporaries wrote about Lincoln. Now, this was not directly in the context of geometry, but to me it's clearly related, that they said, look, what was special about Lincoln? Was it that he was so brilliant as a lawyer? Was it that his arguments were like so clever and insightful? No, he said what's special about Lincoln is that he really was allergic to false argument. It wasn't in him to say something that he didn't feel like he had justified that he could say. Now, that is the Euclidean habit right there to a T. And even now, like, you know, what do we call him? Honest Abe. Hmm. The sort of moral content of geometry is it is a kind of enforced honesty. Oh, that's so interesting. Geometry inclines toward honesty. Huh. And I think, by the way, I think that has always been understood to be part of the goal. I mean, there's a wonderful thing I found in the 1950s. There was a giant survey asking teachers of high school geometry, like, hey, why are you doing this? Like, what's the point of what you're doing? And they offered like a long list. And one of the items was so that the students will like know facts about geometry, like know like how triangles and circles and lines, et cetera, behave. And that did pretty well. It was number two. But number one was to develop the habit of rigorous and logical thinking. That's mm -hmm. why I think it has always mm -hmm. been the consensus among educators that we're not teaching that subject because we need a population of people who know that the angles of a triangle sum to 180 degrees. It's because we need a population of people who can understand how you could convince yourself of that fact and other facts like it. What's it like to write about math? Because as a non-math person, the idea in my head is, it must be like translating. Like you know one language, math, and then you're translating it into words. Well, you know what writing about math is like? 
it's like writing about other things than math. That's what it's mainly like. I mean, I got to be honest with you that, you know, I started out, I did start out sort of seeing those two pursuits as separate tracks from each other. I was like really interested in writing. I took a lot of creative writing courses in college. And then after I was done with college, I sort of knew I wanted to like pursue math and get a PhD. But for that first year, I did something totally different. I went and did a master's degree in creative writing at Johns Hopkins. This wonderful, you published a novel. I did. Without that, well... I wrote a novel that sat in my filing cabinet for 10 years until someone wanted to publish it. So it's a, that comes a little later. But, you know, at that stage of my life, these were two different things. I'm going to stop doing the math thing and spend a year doing the writing thing. And it's been incredibly important to me to have this moment at which I was kind of given permission to sort of call myself a writer. It's not a hobby. It's one of the things that I am. Nevertheless, I missed math every day. Hmm. And knowing What did that, you miss about it? Um, what can I say except that it's fun? In the doing of mathematics and in the making of mathematics, there's always some kind of spirit of play. Even in the way we talk about it, we say we're sort of messing around, we're playing around. Maybe I'm trying to make some argument where there is no argument and it's a purely temperamental distinction. It may just be that I have more fun doing that. That could be, but but I am also thinking the emphasis in writing, it's very much about your individual voice. Whereas math, it seems, I'm sure there's that in math also, but it also feels like you're taking part in some larger profession that you share with a lot of other people and you're all making contributions. Actually, that is a really great point. And I think that does speak to a true difference that math is a fundamentally communal activity that you're creating something that's your own, but it's part of a gigantic project that's thousands of years long and that knock on wood, is going to continue for thousands of years after us. If there's some theorem I try to prove and I don't prove, if it's true, somebody else is going to prove it. I'd like to do it. I would feel proud and I feel like I contributed something. But if I don't, somebody else will. And, you know, maybe when you're younger, you have a little bit more of like a hunger for recognition. And maybe if you try to do something and you don't, and then somebody else does it, you're like, oh man, like I wish I'd gotten that. Now I love it. Now nothing makes me happier when somebody proves something that I tried to do. 10 or 20 years ago and I couldn't do. Do you remember when you first recognized numbers? That's a great question. I mean, I was very interested in math and numbers from a young age. You know, a lot of people discover they're excited about math later in life and some early. So I was one of the early ones. So I guess in a way, it's my roundabout way of saying, um, no, I don't really remember the moment. I mean, I can tell you, you know, it's a story I tell a lot. Because I think realizing what mathematics is, is a little bit different from realizing what numbers are. Mm-hmm. And I think when I realized what mathematics was, and this is going to be a geometry story in its way, it was just this moment when I was like zoning out. I was probably like six, I don't know. Looking at my parents' stereo system. And to set the scene, this is the 70s, right? So I'm dating myself. So in the 70s, you got to have like kind of dark wood panels on everything. And so there's like a dark wood panel over the stereo and there's like a bunch of holes in it so the sound can come out. And the holes are arranged in a rectangular array, like a sort of six by eight rectangle of holes. And there I am just kind of like lying on the thick brown shag carpet because remember it's the 70s and looking at these holes, six rows of eight holes each, right? Mm -hmm which are also eight columns of six holes each. You know, flip your attention back and forth and sort of organize them in your mind, seeing the rows, then seeing the columns, and seeing the rows, and then seeing the columns. And then in that moment, you're like, whoa, so like six eights is the same thing as eight sixes, right? Six rows of eight is the same thing as eight columns of six. And this was an amazing fact. This is an amazing moment because if you start to learn your multiplication tables whenever you learn them, You might say, well, I know that six times eight is eight times six because that's in the table. But there's a difference between knowing it because somebody told you and knowing it because you know it. Knowing it in this way where you're like, oh, there's no other way it could possibly be. It's not the case because somebody told me. It's the case because it just is. It has to be. That's mathematics. Mm -hmm. That's what separates it from everything else that we learn in school. That, you know, most things that happen in school, in some sense, you don't really know it's so, except on authority of the teacher or on authority of a book that you read, right? Math is different, and especially geometry is different. Ideally, you're giving the student the capacity to 
make knowledge on their own from scratch. So you want to talk about dangerous. There's a reason people saw geometry as dangerous, exactly because it represented some other locus of authority. Last ending question. You came up with a playlist recently for Shape, which I had fun listening to. And the last song you chose, it's one of my old favorites, Talking Heads. Why'd you choose that one for the end? Yeah, the song Once in a Lifetime, which it feels like math to me, partly because the sort of like incredible spiritedness and forcefulness and joyfulness in it, but also because like literally when I was in high school in training for the Math Olympiad, the cassette of Stop Making Sense is like what I'd play every night. So it feels like math to me because it was when I was doing math that I was like listening to it all the time. I'm drinking Mandarin Orange Slice, my math drink. That was like, you know, everything. I mean, the 80s, young people, that's what the 80s was like. Mandarin Orange Slice and Talking Heads. That's why I closed the playlist Oh, that's with it. so interesting because the playlist includes a lot of songs that are very definitely about math. And this one is less obviously. And so I was trying to think. And you may ask yourself... Why, is, why this song? And I was thinking about the line that keeps getting repeated. Water flowing underground. Water at, at the bottom of the ocean. Because he's conjuring up our ordinary boring lives with our houses and our suburban driveways and stuff. Large automobile. And then you let it all go down into the water flowing underground. And I thought maybe that's how you feel about math and geometry, that it is like the hidden substrate of everything. Yeah, and this is like a great place to come back to because it comes back to the beginning. And you may find your soul. Under the rocks and stones, water flowing underground, right? This is like this kind of famous motto of like the 68 revolutionaries in Paris, under the stones, the beach, which Grail Marcus writes about as kind of the founding document of punk rock. That's where he says, you know, even though this is this built up city around us, these structures that appear impregnable, six inches under it, under the water, there's the living earth. Carry the wall with your act. Right? It's just a shell mm-hmm. under which is like the real living thing. And maybe we'll finish with Poincare because one thing I learned as a Poincare, this besides sort of creating modern topology and geometry, also was incredibly quotable. Maybe one of the most quotable mathematicians who ever lived. And he talks about geometry, this kind of formal, rigid structure that many people find kind of oppressive when they learn it in school. Strict logic. He says you got to think of it like the skeleton of a sponge. You sort of come across it and you see this very beautiful structure and you're like, this is not my beautiful house. Wow, what an interesting structure. I can like really see like all kinds of things about it and it's perfectly formed and perfectly rigid. And he says, but If you don't know that it was created by a living being in order to support it, you're missing something. And the living being, the sponge and the skeleton, that's the intuition. How did I get here? And this is Poincaré's vision of geometry, that there's the structure, there's the rigidity, but it's there to support something that's under it, that's alive. Same as it ever was. You know, I hope one thing I can do in the book is always to kind of have the sponge be there. Put you in contact with the water flowing underground, the living thing that it's all there to support. Wow, thank you so much. Thank you, this is fantastic. Here the twister comes. Here comes the twister. Jordan Ellenberg is a professor of mathematics at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And now that you've learned to love geometry, check out his new book. It's called Shape. The Hidden Geometry of Information, Biology, Strategy, Democracy, and Everything Else. Coming up, French neuroscientist Stanislas Dahan says it's not language that makes us human, it's geometry. The story of how your brain makes shape. Next, on to the best of our knowledge, from Wisconsin Public Radio and PRX. How do we do? I feel like I got into it at the end. I feel like it was like... You were fantastic. You always do. Same as it ever was. If you give a four-year-old a crayon and ask her to draw a house, she'll probably come up with a wobbly square or a rectangle, maybe a triangle for a roof. 
And this might not seem all that remarkable, but take a minute and think about what it means. From an incredibly early age, humans see the world in terms of its underlying geometry. We recognize shapes before we even know their names. And recent neuroscience suggests that intuitive understanding of geometry might just be what makes us human. Steve Paulson is here to explain. There's a long history of theories about what sets humans apart from every other animal. Once, it was thought to be agriculture, then tool-making, then the ability to deceive the people around you. But scientists kept finding other species that do all these things, and today language is often seen as the one unique human talent, or at least language with grammar and syntax. But a prominent French neuroscientist has another theory, based on his research using fMRI neuroimaging and sophisticated computational models. Stanislas Dehaene believes there's an even more basic cognitive skill that might have evolved before language, geometry. Now, if you've ever watched a dog race after a ball that's been thrown in the air and then in one single acrobatic motion leap up to catch it, you know animals have a basic sense of geometry. But that's not the kind Dehaene is talking about. Well, actually, we have to distinguish two different forms of geometry. All animals, because they have to move around, they have to have a sense of their environment. And there is a lot of beautiful research showing how they map space around them, and you can call that the first sense of geometry. But my claim is that we humans have uh, something else. We have a sense of discrete, symbolic perception of the world around us. And we've done experiments, not just speculation, we've done experiments suggesting that our perception of something like a square, for instance, is quite peculiar compared to all other animals. We perceive right angles and squares and parallel lines, which are geometric symbols that don't actually exist in the natural world, at least not as perfectly formed as we can see them in our minds. Yeah, there are lines that look almost parallel on a slab of striated rock. Or if you look into the honeycomb of a beehive, all those tiny cells look kind of hexagonal. But when you look closely, they're not actually perfect angles or exact parallel lines. Now, you might be thinking, what's the big deal? Well, for some reason, our ancient ancestors were obsessed with geometric shapes and patterns. They carved them into rocks and drew them on cave walls. For instance, if you go to the Lascaux cave in the south of France, you see not just these beautiful depictions of animals, but you see a rectangle. And whenever you see a rectangle, well, you know it's not an animal that uh, Hmm. has been scratching the walls. It's an intentional geometrical doing. We think that this is unique to humans. Well, and if you go way back, even much further than the cave paintings in Lascaux, back in human history, tens of thousands of years, there are symbols engraved in rocks of spirals and zigzags and parallel lines, symbols that I think we would call geometric. Absolutely. In fact, uh, this is not so well known, but the earliest forms are not paintings, are not real depictions of animals or life forms. They are really symbolic geometrical forms. There's a freshwater shell that was found on the island of Java that has a zigzag engraved in it, two sets of alternating parallel lines. Scientists say it's half a million years old, so that even predates Homo sapiens. It goes back to Homo erectus, And just to draw this simple pattern, Dahan says you need a basic sense of angles and parallel lines. And if you go even earlier than that, everybody knows about the tools that are made of stone, which are called bifaces. They are very common in prehistory and date perhaps as early as 1.5, 1.8 million years ago. And they are very geometrical. They are symmetrical in two planes. That's why uh, they are called bifaces. So we see that in order to design these tools, the ancient humans must have had some idea of concepts such as perpendicularity and parallelism. So why do you think these, I don't even know if we would call them our ancient ancestors. I mean, we're talking species that predate Homo sapiens. Why do you think they made those engravings? Why would they be compelled to carve these symbols into rock? Well, you see, uh, we don't really know the meanings 
that they could have attributed to these signs. But I'm not really interested in this question of the meaning. I'm interested in the existence of the signs themselves and the shapes that they take. Because I came to this trying to understand the human singularity, what is special to humans. And I think that this existence of these signs is enough to say there is a sort of language of geometry. It looks like an organized mathematical language. So my own research has been trying to prove that in addition to the language that we use to communicate meanings, there is also an internal language in the brain, a language that allows us to formulate shapes. In other words, to see shapes as a kind of language that's actually part of how we think. We're not just talking about zigzags, of course, but as you say, it's spirals, squares, friezes that we see, for instance, in ancient Greece and, of course, much before. All of the decorative arts are based on a sort of language of shape. So this may be a stupid question, but what exactly is geometry? I mean, what makes a shape or a collection of lines geometric? Hmm. That's a great question. It was well defined by Euclid. And of course, we talk about Euclidean geometry as perhaps the first formulation of what is geometry. So it's a system made of a very small set of elements, which are points and lines, angles, and planes, basically, and their combinations. It's amazing that humans accept to build such a complicated, wonderful system out of such puny foundations. But of course, it's the same in all areas of mathematics. We start with a very small set of concepts and axioms, and from that, we build up a whole system. Mathematics is a construction based on a very small set of elementary foundations. Do you think geometric thinking, this ability to see shape and think of them that way, do you think that came before language in the evolution of the human brain? This is now speculation. But yes, I think there's a strong possibility that the first thing that evolved during hominization is the capacity to think better about the external world. And geometry is a way to perceive abstract structures in the external world. It's a way to represent information in a more compact form. In neuroscience, we speak of the brain as a system for compressing information. And symbolic representation is the ultimate compression. It's down to just a few symbols that express a zigzag, for instance. So yes, this could have come before the ability to speak about these objects and to share them with each other. And this is, I think, the key function of language is to save time. We don't have to reinvent or rediscover what others have discovered. By sharing information inside a culture, we narrow down the search. It's been called the ratchet effect of culture. So to summarize, perhaps first, we have the ability to think very abstract ideas, and this could date back perhaps as long as two million years ago. And then, perhaps more recently, we have an explosion of culture with Homo sapiens, because we're able to share these ideas. There's one other thing that's kind of surprising. You might think doing geometry, seeing these patterns of shapes and lines, would be an inherently visual process. But Han says there are plenty of blind people who are gifted mathematicians. It's actually extraordinary, but you can be blind and be an excellent mathematician and be an excellent geometer. So surely vision helped. But it's a very common observation that many blind people love mathematics and are very good in mathematics. This is essentially not just a visual ability, it's it's essentially an internal construction. And the construction can start with data from any of the senses. The brain generates ideas and projects them onto the outside world. So we think of squares, we think of spirals, even though we never see a real one in the external world. It's never perfect. In our mind, it's perfect. And that's where the ideas are generated before we ever see a triangle we can think about one. So there is an age-old debate about whether mathematics is discovered or invented. Is it out there in the world, or is it created by the human mind? What do you think? I think I've made my position clear, right? It's a creation of the human mind. It starts in the brain, and that's why you can be blind and still develop mathematics. However, we select our mathematics in part because it's useful. 
to the external world. And of course, the foundations of our mathematics, the sense of space, the sense of number, were selected through evolution because they were useful in many animal species. I'm actually surprised that you say that it comes from the mind. I mean, if you think about the laws of physics, the structure of the universe, isn't that fundamentally mathematical in nature, regardless of whether humans are around or not? Well, it's a big debate. I think that we pick out, at the scale that we live in, we pick out structures and we simplify them. That's the whole purpose of the brain, is to discretize, simplify, compress the information. So mathematics are useful abstractions, but they are arising in our brains as we try to describe the extraordinary complexity of the universe. Stan, you have been studying these questions for many years and doing incredible research. Why are you so interested, particularly in the neuroscience of mathematics? Ha! Well, there are many reasons. One of them is that I love mathematics as a student. I was a very good uh, uh, student of mathematics. I actually boarded the École Normale Supérieure, which is very famous in France for its mathematicians. And I also have a very strong interest in education. So as I was learning mathematics, I became fascinated in how we change. I remember very well, for instance, when I learned about complex numbers. And I don't know if you know about complex numbers, but there's this very funny idea that you can take the square root of a negative number. And the first time I met this, I was flabbergasted. You know, I was told for my entire young life that the square is a positive number. Right. Two times two, it has to be positive. Three times three, four times four, it's always positive. Even if you do minus two times minus two, you get a positive number, right? And what's very funny in mathematics is that after a few weeks, you totally accept these concepts. You find them not only natural, but very useful, and you know how to compute with them, and then you develop very strong intuitions of them. So I remain completely fascinated by how we learn. And that's the title of my book. Mm -hmm. But it's also very concrete motivation, which is that there are some children that find it very difficult. They are just discouraged. They never cross this threshold where you find mathematics fascinated and like a mind teaser, which is exciting, like a puzzle. So I uh, work now for the French government also to try to uh, help design pedagogical tools or better pedagogies that can convey to all children, because I think all children have this potential, the power and the beauty of mathematics. So why do so many people, and I'll include myself in here, when you get older, you sort of become a little afraid of mathematics or, you know, in any kind of a complicated way. I mean, we seem to do something wrong in school in terms of how we usually teach mathematics. Well, you say that it, it has a lot to do with anxiety and also convincing yourself that you are not good at it. You go into math class and you start to sweat because you might be called to the front and you will not be able to answer and you have a feeling of being completely lost. This is a situation where the brain's learning algorithm is blocked. So I think this is what we are doing wrong. And here in France, we're trying to introduce pedagogies that are based on games or challenges, puzzles. All of mathematics was constructed because there were interesting problems to solve and interesting abstractions um, to develop. So suppose the French government were to appoint you czar of all education in the country. <laughs> <laughs> and it's up to you to design schools that tap into this curiosity, this innate drive that we have to learn. What would you recommend? I mean, how should schools work differently? And I'm not a czar. <laughs> I'm not able to predict the future. But uh, what we're trying to do here, I, I started the Scientific Council for Education with the spirit of experimenting, first of all. So we are, for, for the moment, uh, we are running a giant experiment with 67,000 children where we see whether the introduction of card games and board games in first grade make a difference in terms of learning mathematics. And at the end of the year, we're going to know whether the kids who receive the games were doing better. It seems that, for instance, playing with board games where, you know, you move by a certain number as a function of the number that you drew on a dice, for instance, this is very useful to understand and develop the sense of number. The mapping of number to space is really at the heart of geometry and mathematics. Hmm. So this is what I would propose, the introduction of games, but the very careful monitoring and measurement of whether this is having a positive effect on children or not, because we need to learn much more before we can apply this science to the schools.
Stanislas Dehaan is a cognitive neuroscientist at the Collège de France. He's the author of The Number Sense, How the Brain Creates Mathematics, and most recently, How We Learn. Steve Paulson brought us that story. Thanks for joining us today. Whether you love math or generally try to avoid it, I hope we helped you find some wonder in the underlying geometry of the world and of your own mind. To the best of our knowledge is created by a small team of audio producers who use math every week to make a 59 minute show. Thanks to Angelo Batista, Shannon Henry Kleiber, Charles Monroe Kane, Mark Rickers, Joe Hartke, Steve Paulson, and me, Anne Strainchamps. And thanks also to Sarah Hopeful for extra sound design this week. Until next time. What's it like to be a geometer today? Let's awesome. say. Awesome. Oh, sorry, do you have a further question? <laughs>